The primary mission of the LST is to land artillery and tanks on an enemy beach, ready to fight through enemy opposition, to carry them long distances from their home port to foreign shores. In addition, they're used as lighters to unload transports and cargo ships where no harbor facilities are available. This ship is especially built and equipped for these jobs. Doors in the bow allow a ramp to be lowered for unloading cargo directly onto the beach where with its shallow forward draft, the LST may be driven. An elevator is used in lowering deck cargo to the tank deck, which is approximately on the waterline of the ship. The ship is equipped with a stern anchor used in retracting when the ship is loaded at the beach or unloaded on the beach. The powerful winch plus reversing screws make it possible to retract from the beach. Tanks, artillery, and heavy vehicles are carried on the tank deck with direct access to the bow ramp. Light and medium weight vehicles, cargo, and supplies are stowed on the main deck. The troops are billeted in compartments provided on the second deck and fed in their own mess compartments adjacent to the galley on the long haul overseas. The guys are preparing for breakfast right now in the galley. The, the oatmeal is ready. Is the oatmeal ready? Oh, and that's oatmeal. our oatmeal king over there. Oh, okay. I want to talk to the oatmeal king. Hi there. Hello, hello, and good morning. <laughs> I'm, oh, my lens is fogging up. Oh, oh look at that. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> how, how much oatmeal are you making? Well, mass quantities. Let's put it that way. Uh-huh. Everybody likes the oatmeal. We usually empty this pot. And besides uh, Oatmeal King, what is your name, sir? My name is David Cassell. All right. Okay. Good invitation. For <laughs> <laughs> Mother's a. <laughs> and who's your partner over here? It's Jack. Hello, uh, Jack. How are you? I'm just fine. Yourself, brother? I'm good. I guess you're the Waffle King. I, I'm in charge of the waffles this morning. We've got about. 60 some waffles ready to go. And uh, what's the size of the crew now? Uh, the crew, I would say, is right in the average of 50 something. Okay. So. And uh, that's enough waffles? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> right. uh, what's your favorite food that you prepare? Oh, geez. I think we had fried chicken the other night. It was pretty good. Yeah. All right. Well, I like the tacos that I have. Yeah. They're very good. All of it. All of it's good. I mean, it's a different kind of a recipe. It's not a basic meal. It's just uh, it's a little five, extra step. Five-star restaurant, yeah. right? Five-star restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> and this is Owen. Yeah, you got me. Guilty as charged. Owen, uh, what's your... Are you the overseer? I'm, I'm the chief cook on board, yes, sir. I okay. I plan all the menus, buy all the food, and keep, try to keep these guys in line, but they, they keep me in line instead. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. It's about two minutes till revelry, and then everyone will get up. And so it begins another day on the LST 325. You guys ready? Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful morning in Cape Girardeau. Jack Stevens said it's time to get up and get your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come right on in. This uh, area you're in right now is the main living quarters and mess deck for the enlisted crew. Out of 1,051 of these built in World War II, every one of this model was exactly the same. So if you ever knew anybody on an LST enlisted, this is where they lived, right here on the fantail, or down the starboard side. Any of the troops we hauled, and that was just for the drivers of the tanks and trucks, because this was not a troop ship. They lived down on this ship, they lived down on the port side. 
as crew members now, we have the starboard side for the crew members, and we have a few guys here. Otherwise, this was wide open, all bunk areas back then. All below was a mess deck. We had walk-in freezers and coolers from World War II. They told me the other day, we always carry our own food supply with us when we're cruising. They said we have about $9,000 worth in our freezers now. They just changed them over last year. Otherwise, we were running with exactly the same equipment from World War II. And we got new stuff now, and it broke down the other day, and we just put it in last year. Wasn't made in China, was it? Uh, it probably was. <laughs> yeah, it probably was. What's your favorite part of the ship? The mess hall. You know, that's what everybody says. And why do you think that is? <laughs> Food. <laughs> <laughs> Food. <laughs> <laughs> the plaque you're looking at over here, our captain, he's aboard right now, our, he's originally retired last year. He looked all over the world for an LST to build a memorial out of, and he found this one in a Greek naval shipyard in Crete being junked. There's five or six of them. He notified a bunch of his friends here in the United States about it. The Greek government, after a few negotiations, agreed to give it to them to make a memorial out of. They went over in their own time and money. They spent one whole summer over there with no air, no electric, rebuilt this thing, and brought it back to Mobile. That was in January of 2000. Oh, yeah. One, two, three. Good morning. He does that to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, this is this is where all of our crew members live on the ship back here, and we eat here. We eat here now. The next part of the ship is the best part of all. It's the kitchen, and it's right over your head. And they're cooking our dinner right now. Enlisted in the Navy at 17 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm a Steeler fan. Your duties aboard the museum ship now, uh, probably you wear several hats, I imagine. Yes, yes what, I do. What is it that you do day to day? Well, it, uh, for the last few years I've been working these throttles right here in front of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, 
We, we're four on, four off, or four on, eight off, depending on how much help we have. So we run the river 24-7 to get, to, just like the Cape here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so whenever we go Nashville or wherever, I'll, I'm here, that's what I do. Now this year, I moved up there and I'm backing up the pilot. And during the war, I piloted the ship. Uh, I didn't have a rank or anything, but I run the throttles and, uh, and steered the ship many hundreds of thousands of miles uh, in the South Pacific, of course. Were all the LSTs pretty similar? Yes. Across the board? Yeah, I would, uh, just for a number, 98% exactly the same. Mm -hmm. They varied in, some had more Higgins boats than others. They all had two, one each side, Port Starboard. Then they have four, this had four originally, and some have six. So, when you say, everybody asks, well, how many crew, how many crew? Well, it depends how many boats we had because you have a, had to have at least three, maybe four, for a boat crew. So if you had an extra four boats, you know, the numbers went hop higher. More guns, they had different numbers of 22, all on aircraft, uh, 20 millimeters and 40 millimeters. And they built, as I understand it, uh, 1,051 in the, like a Well, the number or... varies over the heck, but uh, I keep hearing 28, so that that's just flexible and doesn't mean much. Right. And all LSTs, World War II versions, had numbers only and no names. Did you guys ever give it a nickname? Well, yeah, some you could, I could repeat, some I can't. <laughs> but the continue on this is that somebody say, uh oh, there's three or four, they have this, uh, use county names, county names. Well, we're, that's the exception. Uh, when they ever bring any back, for whatever reason, repair or update, modify, uh, then they give them a county name and the number stayed the same. It happened to be a World War II version. So, but the, basically they only had numbers because for a thousand ships and try to give them all names and keep track of that, and numbers yeah. was the way to go. Right now, this ship here, uh, if it was in better condition, you could say the whole thing. We can take any product from railroad cars to razor blades, canines, and we've hauled everything. Put them on this ship, we can deliver it anywhere in the world, and we need no help. The crew will unload, and put it on shore, and leave. Anywhere you want it. The ship is designed to do that. We don't have tugboats, we don't need piers, we don't need anything. That's the way these ships were built, and they were built for a one-way trip. If it went over uh, to Iwo Jima, or because we was there before that, and uh, did the job, it paid for itself, and that was more. And we gave them more because they still existed after that. We didn't lose them all. They didn't all sink. They didn't all break up, even in a typhoon. We was in two typhoons. Uh, when we went to uh, Okinawa, they said that was the worst ty typhoon they had in 150 years, and that was right after D-Day. And it, we lost ships, we had damaged carriers, we had damaged battle wagons. Ships were on the ground and they just scrapped them. They didn't even think about it. How would you like history to remember the LSDs? Well, oh, <laughs> that's a good one. I, I would say this, that McHale's Navy movies and stuff, he got all his stories from us guys. <laughs> we were first, and we did 80% of what he did, or they showed on there, mm -hmm. other than we didn't mess with officers' country, and that, that, that you don't do that. <laughs> but the, the washing the clothes and doing this and making booze and all that stuff, we did it all. We did it all. What we're hearing right now, the telemetry, is that Morse code that we're hearing? In the background, you're hearing Morse code, yes. Uh, and is that still used a lot today? It's no longer used by the military. Uh, they've adapted to high-speed data type transmission and satellites and so forth. Uh, it is still taught to the military, all branches, basically, for intercept purposes, for snoop snooping, if you want to call it that. Okay. And can you give us a little demonstration of that? Uh, not the intelligence gathering. Oh, but no. <laughs> first demonstration would be, for example, if I were actually on duty.
And this was a demonstration of 25 words a minute, as fast as you'd be typing on a communications typewriter, which is all capital letters, and that's all we, all we needed. And uh, on the, most of the time there was the receiving and typing. Uh, but if you had to uh, get on the air and use Morse code to uh, talk back to uh, not so much your operating fleet, but to the United States or any shore station that you had a message for, well then you, then you would actually uh, uh, operate the transmitters and uh, then I would actually uh, get on the air here and uh, get my message form out and, uh, and start sending. Uh, So, what did you just say there? I was sending a, me uh, a message back to uh, NSS Washington D.C., which is the naval, the Navy uh, main Navy station. What is your favorite part about the LSD? Uh, favorite part really is being a part of um, a living museum and uh, demonstrating it to the public. Uh, so that's the big picture. It's it's really what we're doing, and. It's very satisfying to uh, pass along the history of a very important time in our country's uh, existence. So, What would you like to say to any kids who are just fascinated with this entire room? Well, the, uh, as far as uh, radio operation, the Navy still does it. It's in a little, diff little different form now, more automated. But to uh, enter into the world of uh, Morse code and uh, other intriguing communications modes. It's still available through amateur radio uh, to the most, to a large extent. And uh, if you're one interested to uh, check with uh, an agency called the American Radio Relay League, ARRL, and they will refer you to uh, somewhere where you can be taught this skill. Hi, I'm David Coker crew member LST-325. And we're going to go on a tour? We're going to go on a tour of the ship. Let's go. All right, this the ship was designed by a naval architect by the name of John C. Niedermeyer, who prior to World War II had experience as a submarine designer. And some of the things that he knew, he learned about submarine design, he put into the design of LSTs. Here you can see this double wall construction where you have an outer wall and an inner wall. And because the ship has a flat bottom, it has a tendency to flex. So you see these half rounds and I-beams that are welded into these internal bulkheads, which allows the ship to flex. And it, it does flex like this from time to time. And these function like longerons in the fuselage of an aircraft um, so that the ship doesn't rip itself apart when it's sailing on the ocean. Now this picture right here is from the very first invasion that this ship was used on. It was a part of Operation Husky, which was the invasion of Sicily on the beach at Gala. The green on the bulkheads indicates the officer's country, and down through these passageways are staterooms on either side that would have been shared by the officers who would serve aboard the ship. And right in here is the wardroom. Some of our crew members are in here. The wood paneling was added by the Greeks. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the wheelhouse. It is where the ship would originally have been operated from. And we have a, an array of different navigational and control 
devices here, some of which we still use, some of which we don't. This is called an enunciator. You've probably seen these in films before. This device would be used to communicate with the men in the engine room because at that, at, during World War II, the men in the engine room actually controlled the speed of the engines. We don't use this any longer. Today, we control the engines using these two throttles that are hydraulic electro, electrical throttles that control the engine speed. While we are sailing, the pilot of the ship will shout orders down through this voice tube and then the three men that work in here will control the, th the throttles, will log everything according to at, at whatever time that an engine speed change is requested, it will be recorded in this log. This device right here is a gyro repeater. We don't use this anymore, but it is operational. And the wheel is also no longer used. There is a joystick in the conning tower up above that is used to actually control the ship. One other device that I'll point out is this binnacle. It is a floating compass that makes the correction between magnetic north and due north and this device would be used in the event that there's a power failure and the gyroscope no longer would be operational. This is a 40 millimeter Bofors cannon. <clears throat> the Bofors company <coughs> is Swedish and during the war or prior to the war they were building these guns practically by hand and it took almost 200 hours for the men to hand build these guns. Chrysler Corporation started building them during World War II under license and they set up assembly lines and they reduced the manufacturing time from 200 hours to about nine hours and they built them in single twin and quad barreled configurations. We only have single and twin barrel on LST-325. We have two twin barrels and we have four single barrel Bofors cannons. Up here we have a davit holding a LCVP, Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. The vanguard of your invasion force would go in in an LCVP. Hundreds of them were used during the D-Day invasion. They could carry 30 men or one small vehicle like a, like a Jeep and about 10 men. They were built by the Higgins Marine Company during World War II in New Orleans out of marine plywood. But these were built by the British they're made out of fiberglass with reinforced steel hulls. This is the main deck that you can see from this position. And during a given invasion, your wheeled vehicles, trucks, ambulances, jeeps, anything with pneumatic tires would be stowed up here, as many as 40 of them during a given run and you'll notice that they have different cleats than what we had down in the in the in the main deck or in the tank deck uh, because a wheeled vehicle could run over one of these things and not crush it but on the on the tank deck they had to be flush with the ground and here we are in the engine room we have two electromotive diesel model 567 locomotive engines they're V12, two-cycle configuration. They produce 900 horsepower at the shaft. The power then goes through this Falk gear reduction unit. It reduces revolutions by 2.3 to 1, then goes out through a 60-foot shaft that protrudes through the hull of the ship and turns the, the propellers. 
we had these apart a couple years, about four years ago, and they said the gears are excellent. So they've not been damaged at all. These engines, one of them is original to the ship. One of them has been replaced. And they're kind of difficult to find parts for, as you might imagine. But uh, they run very well, considering their age. And uh, our engineering crew works on them constantly to keep them in, in a good state of repair. This is a flywheel that was removed from the starboard main engine in Mobile, Alabama. And you will notice that only about two of the eight bolts that were holding that thing onto the crank of that engine remained intact. I point this out to people to suggest that there was an element of divine intervention involved in these men being able to uh, bring this ship all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. The average age was 73 years. And this was the condition of the flywheel when they got to Mobile, Alabama. Um, so I am convinced that, uh, that the Lord was with them on their journey. What is your favorite part about being involved with the LST? Just the fact that we can showcase this vessel. It's the only one of its kind, the last of the class, as one of the hats say, uh, and bring it to the inland, to the cities along the inland waterways of North America and show people what these ships were like. This is the last remaining World War II era vessels that actually operates under its own power in this part of the country. There's also a Liberty ship of this vintage out in California, but this is the only one that sails in the eastern part of the United States.